<laughs> so uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, actually, I don't know if you've talked to Ralph Kolb or if he's notified you, you guys of um, an issue that they discovered up by just below the Wall Street Bridge on the east side of the harbor. There's an old outlet there that they discovered a, a manhole um, that they thought was not connected to anything. And uh, they sent somebody down in there and they discovered that it's situated so that during a very high flow event, there could potentially be some mixing of wastewater with stormwater discharging, but they have since repaired it. They built a weir inside the, so brick culvert, I think it's 50 inches, pretty amazing brickwork, but they've, uh, they've since blocked it off. So there's no potential for, and they put some testing equipment in there as well to determine, but it doesn't look like there's any discharge to it. It's just a potential way that if the water surcharge is high enough in that sewer pipe, which there's quite a drop down to the sewer, it could potentially get out that way. So they, they fixed that problem. Um, How did they know about it, Chris? Well, they were doing some smoke testing. So they, they, they thought that manhole was not connected to anything. So they, uh, they did some smoke testing and they saw smoke coming up through the manhole. So we asked them if they were gonna monitor the situation. They said, yeah, we will be in touch with um, Harbor Watch and Dick Harris. So I don't know if Dick's heard anything from them yet. I don't suspect yeah. there's anything You've heard about it? Dick, have you heard you about it? Me? Yes, uh, Ralph told me the story. Uh, apparently Harbor Watch is gonna do most of the monitoring and if they need me to do the lower part of the harbor, they'll let me know. Yeah, so I guess there's no way to tell if it has been a source over the years, but it's one that potential source it's been hopefully eliminated. So it's good news. Um, I've also been working with uh, Ralph Kolb on a 319, I mean, not a 319, a FEMA grant for upgrading the pumping station over by Keeler's Brook, Connecticut Avenue. Um, and there's some FEMA money that we had targeted that was old FEMA money from another project that fell apart down Keeler's Brook further. And uh, it's been quite an ordeal to negotiate with Eversource on that site since they own the property. And we finally got headway with Eversource and now FEMA is um, playing hardball. So that's all I can really say about that at this point, but um, we're still gonna have to fight to get that, potentially get that money. And it's about a half a million dollars for a- Oh, well, that would help. Roughly two, two and a half million dollar project or something along those lines depending if they locate it. They're basically they're trying to locate the pumping station out of the floodway to a higher point. Yep. It's still in the 100 year flood plain, but it would at least be less vulnerable, easier to protect. So lots of progress. And now we're back to, I don't know, for some reason FEMA didn't, didn't approve our extension for that grant it was old money. It's legislative pre-disaster mitigation grant. So. At any rate, hopefully I'll have something better to report next time on that. But um, right now, um, like I said, FEMA's playing hardball. Did they give any reason? <laughs> yeah, they gave five reasons. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, a lot of it has to do with the city not having a permanent easement in advance from Eversource to build the station. And so, so they would require that Eversource provide the easement in advance. And the original terms that Eversource requires was completely removing everything down to the, the base of the station, which is probably 15 or 20 feet, maybe more than 25 feet down. And there's a lot of equipment down there. They're going to remove it all, but they were only going to be able to get a crane in. I don't know if you know the site, there's a substation with 
high tension wires. Yep. So they were only able to get a crane in that could, they couldn't go very deep. Other, other words, they could get the equipment out, they get the concrete out 10 feet down, I think. Eversource didn't like that. They wanted everything removed. So well, maybe we, we were able to negotiate through no. deep to, to soften the terms. And we since um, asked FEMA about our extension on the uh, on the grant, which we had not heard anything about that we applied for several months back. And uh, like I said, the, the response just came back from FEMA that they're they're being difficult. So first it was our source, now it's FEMA, but we'll, we'll continue to press on that. Hostage for that easement. We're under what? We, we have, they're, they're coming to us for an easement. Maybe we should hold on right. for that easement. Well, it seemed like Eversource was willing to soften, but FEMA is now, well, they're going to require a permanent easement in advance, whereas the deal was they were going to grant a license to build a new facility and grant an easement after the old facility was sufficiently remediated, but they weren't going to give an advance license, uh, easement for the new station until the old one was taken out to their, to their satisfaction. So that's kind of how it stands. There are a number of other things that they brought up too that were problematic, which is strange because it's a legislative um, grant, and it really shouldn't be that way. But we'll hopefully, like I said, more, more negotiations so we can get somewhere with it. Jeff, your hands up. Yeah, Chris, uh, th this is all good information, but just, just to clarify, our, our, your, your, your job at DEEP, does that make you like the liaison between the city and DEEP for, for knowing this stuff and reporting on it? I, I, I don't mean we... we much appreciate. No one's ever participated from deep in our meetings like this before. But what's your job to do this? And so, how how, how did, for example, do they report to you on matters concerning the wastewater treatment plant and and uh, these other no, things? How, no, how do you not, get? In, what's your job? Well, this this kind of uh, it was assigned. This FEMA grant was assigned to somebody who left the agency and. Frankly, she had kind of sat on it for a long time. It was originally it was supposed to remove a, a dwelling, a house that was located at an intersection of a roadway further down the um, Healers Brook. Uh, so that landowner dropped out of the agreement at the last minute and the money had been sitting. So our, our financial people were at a meeting with managers and they said, well, this money is sitting. How, how are we going to get a project? And somebody said, I'll give it to Malik. He knows some people in Norwalk. He can figure it out. So that's okay. basically what happened. But you, you, your, your department is, is involved with watershed planning. Is that the, the main purpose of, yeah. of the work that you do? That you, I remember you, you were involved in all the watershed plans before. I'm just yeah. wondering. And then, and then the, the report that you made on the, on the discharge up in the upper harbor. Um, so is it through the watershed department well, uh, or? No, no, the, the person who is the liaison to Norwalk's wastewater to Ralph Colvin, the North the WPCA in our municipal systems gave me this information. Okay. So I'm in contact. I'm in constant right. contact with people but, in the but, wastewater. But 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 your your office is is water is is concerned with watershed planning or is that the the name of yeah. it or the title of it? Yeah, it is. Okay. I'm in the water planning management division in the okay. watershed watershed program. All right. Non-point source. Th thank thanks. So, sorry, I just wanted to ask that. <laughs> okay. Well, moving on. Has anybody heard from EverSource? I wore, wore a lot of hats. Different. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, one's, no one's heard from Eversource. No. Okay. Uh, the Department of Transportation via the Shellfish Commission. Did you guys hear from DOT? Dave or Pete? 
No, but there was an email that went out to the listserv like in the last hour um, about the studies that were done on Manresa in terms of its um, suitability as a staging area. And roughly, is it good feasibility or poor feasibility? It's, it's nothing that we don't know from the meeting that we had with them earlier. Okay, thanks, Steve. Welcome. Um, Department of Health, Tom, any news from you guys? No news to report, Jeff. Okay. And John and I both heard from Rick Reardon today, and it was over the disposal of toxic wastes that were used, that came up from dredgings in the river. And the articles he sent us was from, I think, 2002. Um, the, pardon? 87, I thought. No, maybe that was something else. And oh, right. long story short, um, it was all stuff we were aware of. And the toxic waste weren't dumped in the sound because New York um, put up a fight, rightfully so. And they were dumped in CAD cells in the Norwalk River. Um, and that we're aware of. So it's it's nothing new. Is there any, Jeff? Well that that's that's our that's happened twice. That's our our dredging project. And the second time is the Harbor Commission was the in effect the local sponsor for that. So yeah. the, the material that was contaminated and not suitable for open water disposal is the material that was in the vicinity underneath the bridge. And right. it included uh, highway pollutants. So, so they, they, they sequestered that material in what's called confined aquatic disposal cells that were dredged in, in the upper harbor. And the city had a cost share for that. Uh, I forget the amount, whether it was 200 and something thousand dollars. That was the city's cost share for uh, extra handling of the material, however, however we, we called that. And then that, that's what began our multi-year interaction with the DOT to do something with the stormwater discharge from the Yankee Doodle Bridge. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the study that we did, which I, I think is one of the best studies that's been prepared in a long time, demonstrated that the material or made a strong link between the material that had to go in the CAD cell and highway pollutants. And, and as a result, after all the number of years, beginning when the DOT said it wasn't coming from the bridge and they couldn't do anything about it, was, was that Yankee Doodle Bridge project finally uh, adjusted to, to capture stormwater runoff from the bridge uh, uh, you know, the, instead of the 90 plus drains going directly into the bridge. So yeah, we, we, we knew about that. And, and when we talk about the, the poor water quality in the upper harbor, I mean, one, one of the main benefits that, that's been accomplished is that, is that work with the DOT to, to uh, incorporate stormwater management into the Yankee Doodle Bridge. And, I think that, and that's a model for other highway infrastructure projects. So that's a positive thing in, my, in, my, in our opinion. Right. Um, but it had, nothing the, the, to do should, with, it had nothing to do with Rick's letter to us. Well, I didn't see the letter, but you're talking about the CAD cells and the toxic material. Only, and, and, only from the point of Rick Reardon's letter to us, having him having sent uh, historical information like it was new information, and it, and it, it wasn't. Yeah, and then the previous time the harbor was dredged, that was prior much earlier than the Harbor Commission, or prior to the Harbor Commission, uh, it was the same situation: the contaminated material from upstream. Except that previous time. It was felt that the contaminated material most likely came from King Industries, from from uh, uh, industrial practices that, that that are no longer no longer in place. But yeah, anyway, it's, it's uh, that that's my whatever you want to call it input. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, is there anybody in the public out there that uh, would like to provide some input at this time? Okay. I don't see anything or hear anything. So new biz, old business, I don't have anything for old business, but new business, um, I did send a letter out to Kolb, Ralph Kolb, and asked him to join us tonight. And in return, he sent a letter that you all received 
uh, indicating what the project was about and uh, the, the permit renewal uh, was actually, um, all the specifications were listed there. And, and we had concerns primarily about what is the capability of this place? And one of the things I did was a quick calculation using, um, and, and I, I sent this out to you, using their uh, three year data. And what it amounts to is per, per person, the average um, person disposes of 140.2 gallons of water per day that enters the sewage treatment plant. Now, that's not entirely true. It's a rough average. It includes everything, but if you do it up on a per capita, um, the last census that I saw was 89,871 people in this town. Uh, the way New Yorkers are coming into the area, I could imagine that we could reach 90,000 probably by New Year this year. Um, but using the three year data, which they had is 12.6 million gallons per day you have a daily average of 140 gallons. So we could use that to interpolate how many more people theoretically the sewage treatment plant could have and handle. So any questions or comments on it? Do, do we have that figure? Uh, uh, which figure? Uh, basically where the supply demand curve crosses at which point the capacity can no longer handle the increase in population. They're saying um, that the, the present plant can handle 18 million gallons per day of advanced water, uh, wastewater treatment. All right, so we need to do the math to figure out how many people that would be. Well, it would be over 7,000 people. Okay, so we're cutting it pretty close then. Yeah, but um, the upgrade uh, to its head, headwork system, installed six new main lift pumps, allowing the facility to handle wet weather flows up to 95 million gallons per day. So, um, in order for the plant to upgrade and to get, get help, they need 16.2 million gallon days for over 180 days for it to be automatically trigger future expansion discussions. So apparently that's built into some legislation somewhere. So it, you know, it, it gives us an idea of what we can do and what we can't do. And I hope the Planning and Zoning Commission um, takes that to heart and we stay ahead of the game. Jeff? Well, the, you know, the, there's a pending, there's public notice that's still uh, yes. ongoing for public comments on the city's application to renew its discharge permit. Right. And the public notice expires now on, on November 8th. So the Harbor Commission, both the, the water, well, not both, the Water Quality Committee, the Harbor Commission, and the Shellfish Commission sent a letter and that's, that letter is dated October 5th to DEEP. Uh, and and the, the, among other comments, uh, the, commi the commission and the committee noted that there were, and this, this was something that was brought up at the last meeting, Joe, and it was agreed to do this, and that the commission and the committee are aware of plans and proposals that would increase multifamily residential density on and near the harbor, and therefore we, we therefore request that the city as part of the pending pending permit renewal process, provide a statement concerning one, the capacity of the wastewater treatment plant to accommodate the planned and anticipated residential growth, inclu including growth anticipated in the plan of conservation and development and any resulting need and requirements for increasing the plant's capacity in the future. So is, is it your understanding that the, that the materials provided by Mr. Kolb address those, address those statements or? Um, to a limited extent. 
it, it, I don't know what the um, future plans are as far as the city's development. Uh, the way we see apartments going up all over the place. Um, I don't know whether they're planning on a few thousand people or hitting that 7,000 number or going well above it. Uh, I think that would, we'd have to get feedback from planning and zoning. Mm -hmm. With 2,000 new apartments, it's gonna get up there pretty fast. Well, it, it depends on whether they're like uh, family apartments or young single apartments. And, you know, if, if they're small apartments for one or two people, um, you're only talking half of that number. But if they are indeed for families, then that number be becomes pretty achievable. Mm -hmm. But Diane? So, so the harp. The, uh. Uh, just, just a, uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to know, and I may have missed the memo. Um, is there a chance I could get a? We all could get a copy of the letter that was sent to the. I it. Oh, you did. Yeah, to everybody. So, thanks yeah. so much. Thanks. It's a uh, number two. Uh, Joe and and the group. Um, it might be a good idea that if we invite Steve Kleppen, who is currently the planning and zoning uh, director to maybe come to one of our meetings. I have heard him advise the zoning commission when these large uh, residential projects come up. And he has, he said, I've spoken with the sewage treatment plan or in the case of water quantity, he says, I've spoken with the first and second taxing district water utilities. And um, I'm not sure he checks their numbers, but the thing is, I think he, it would be a great opportunity to begin a dialogue on a regular basis as he is developing his budget as all the departments are right now, but also so that he's kind of put on notice that we are concerned uh, as the Water Quality Committee and we want to make sure we have a dialogue ongoing. What he, do you think? He's already aware of that. And his speaking to uh, the sewage treatment plant and the different water districts is a product of us asking, do we have a sustainable level? And he was aware of it, but it was kind of an extra push to, to get it done. So he said he's already talked to the committee. Um, I can ask him if he wants to come to one of these meetings and discuss it, but my gut feeling is he'll do what Ralph did and just send us a, an email saying to what extent um, he's addressed these these issues. Well, no, what my, my thought was we have a dialogue and that he's our a guest speaker for, you know, 15, 10 minutes, we could tell him what topic or topics we'd like him to speak with in a friendly way. You know, he's he plays an important role in the city, as do we, as does the Harbor Commission and the Shellfish Commission. So, um, you know, I, I think it might be a good idea. I can ask him. Okay. I can ask him. Jeff? Yeah, I'm sorry to keep talking. I don't know if anybody else is raising their hand, but the comment period on the, on the, for comments on the permit extension or renewal, that, that comment period expires November 8th. So at the Harbor Commission meeting last week, uh, Mr. Cole was not able to come to the commission meeting, so the Harbor Commission deferred any additional comments, thinking that perhaps he would come to this meeting or the Shellfish Commission meeting. And there may be more information that we could gather that would that would lead to additional comments or recommendations being forwarded to deep before the notice period expires. So, is there any need to provide any additional comments uh, to, to as part of this deep notice, or just just the the letter back in October 5th asking for those statements of 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 need and and anticipated you know demand. Do we, do we want to say anything more about it, Joe, now? I, before I don't. Before the comment period expires. All right, that's my, that's my I question. I don't, but does anybody else have a need for it? No. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make you all aware that I believe that the uh, Save the Sound has successfully uh, submitted a petition for a public hearing. So stay tuned as right. about, about the plant 
I, I, be, I don't think they withdrew it. So uh, I'll try right. to find out. Well, that's a significant, that's a significant thing because then in the public hearing would have the opportunity to ask these questions in, in a public forum. That's right. We, uh, we could we submit. Did, we, we didn't know, we didn't know that. Uh, oh, I know. No, I think it's good that a letter was put together. All right. My understanding so now, is now, they will definitely have that public hearing and they delayed NPDES permit hearings for 30 days. Well, what, what, is, what does that mean, Dick, delayed it for 30 days? Well, there, it was supposed to be a, a date when they all agreed that to extend the permit or not, that date has been pushed out 30 days to catch the public hearing. All right. I heard this from Ralph. I mean, you can go talk to him yourself. Well, what that's information the, is, that we, we never received. Yeah, is there more the information on this? Diane, do you have more information on what Save the Sound is? Um, no, I don't. I, I have been busy the last couple of weeks, but I will find out and, and email you all. <clears throat> Chris, were you aware of, of, the, of that public hearing request or petition to Chris Malik? You're muted, Chris. Uh, yeah, I did hear something, but I thought it might have been on one of the emails from this group. So I'll I'll have to go back and find out more. But I right. I don't know off the top of my head. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Anything else on Ralph Cole and the sewage treatment plant? Okay. Moving on. Uh the Long Island Sound water quality report 2020. Uh, did you all get a chance to take a look at it? Yay yes. or nay? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I was very taken back by it. Because first of all, it's not the 2020 report. It's a 2019 report. And it's not evident it's hidden in the information that it they did come from 2019. So telling the public that it's data from, you know, that it's a report on this year is a little misleading. So I contacted Peter Linderoff, who I had a working relationship and, and taught him to do how to do the water quality testing. And I said, Peter, what, what's up with this? And then I, I, I brought forth several other issues which I shared with you guys um, about the water quality testing. And Jeff and I talked about it um, and not to go over all the issues again, unless anybody has a need for it uh, because it is in writing in what I sent you. Um, I, I think what has to be done at this point is if we in any way subsidize anybody that's doing water quality testing in the river, Jeff made the suggestion that we receive data. And I added that clause to that immediately when the data is collected rather than a year later. And if anything raises a red flag, that people in the city be notified immediately. And the people doing the testing can literally do that within a day or two, not a year or two later. And in that respect, if there is an issue, we can address it. But the other issue I had, which is, it's a philosophical issue. Um, and I tend not to be philosophical. And, and that's, it kind of caught me by surprise when I was thinking of that. And that's that the upper harbor is not a unique upper harbor. There's a lot of harbors around that have similar situations to us that during the summer, uh, the temperature goes up, fish schools move in and the area becomes hypoxic and then sometimes anoxic. And it's a product of the geology. It's a product of the, the flow. It's a product of temperature and the animals that are moving into the area. And what I said to Peter is, how can you fail a harbor for doing what is natural? 
And he had no answer. He said, well, that's what the data says. I said, yeah, but there's times that scientists have to take a look at data and said, well, why is this happening? And if it's natural, what are you gonna do about it? I said, we could put bubblers up there and we could put wave machines up there. And Dick and I talked about this and we, we both kind of laughed at it because we've known that for years. And no, nobody is rushing out to buy bubblers for the upper harbor so that we could get oxygen into the water. Diane? You're muted, Diane. Yeah, thank you. Um, when I read um, the report, I, I think I was uh, just finishing up a beautiful glass of white wine and I was feeling all warm and bubbly. And I thought, you know, this is an opportunity for us in the city to look at and begin advocating for green infrastructure, reduction of pervious surfaces, which many of us do in whatever programs we're working with over time. But I believe that some of this degradation is not natural. It is from the high amount of pervia surfaces in especially coming from the areas north of that point at the top of the harbor. Um, and so I just think it's a great opportunity, especially since everyone and their brother is talking green infrastructure. There will be, depending upon what happens in Washington, but even in the state, there will be monies for helping a city do real green infrastructure projects. So I think we could use this report as an excuse, although we don't need an excuse, because this has been an issue that all of us have been aware of. Um, I would love to see us have that green infrastructure guest speaker. I'd love to help with that, Joe, in the, in the near future, maybe before the end of the or early next year. Um, especially noted is that the uh, DPW, ha everyone is putting together their budgets now. In fact, they've been doing it for the last month. It has been difficult to get Anthony Carr on some of the larger projects that they are doing related to flooding to commit to making sure that they at least look at some green infrastructure as opposed to traditional engineering, underground piping, that sort of thing. And I think, I think it would be great if we help support he, he and his staff and with planning and zoning who can ask for green infrastructure when they have applicants. I think it would be perfect opportunity for us to move on green infrastructure like New Haven has done. <laughs> Any comments? Thank Louise? Um, I was just going to say we could go back to the idea of having Bill Lucy. I know he's interested in coming and speaking to us about Norwalk becoming a um, stormwater authority uh, city. Is that, am I saying that right? I forgot, I forgot the term for it, but um, I know he's interested in coming and, and just having him come explain that and, and maybe how we could support that idea or introduce it in Norwalk. I also think that there, a report like this can help us try to protect flow in the Norwalk River and its tributaries, which I have kind of continually under uh, threat. Um, because it, I think from Dick explaining things to me that that is one of the things that help, that is important to uh, this issue. So it's an opportunity in that way as well. And maybe we should think about, I mean, maybe I should talk to you more, Chris. I know you mentioned that maybe a 319 in Norwalk makes more sense than at the top of the river. So um, I can, we can follow up and think about if. Yeah, um, DEEP has been working with EPA and there's a lot more attention now on the estuaries and the places where fresh and salt water mix, the ones that are constricted like the Norwalk Harbor, especially. We have published our integrated water resource management plan, which highlights a number of estuaries, coastal embayments that for targeted for extra funding for remediation and other programs. And the Norwalk Outer Basin is, is one of them. You know, the Inner Basin is even worse. But um, from my perspective, I think that the nitrogen inputs 
and, and Diana's right, green infrastructure can help if in fact there are there's stormwater infiltrating into the pipes that would cause those kind of overflows at the wastewater plant that are normally treated solid removal and chlorination um, before discharge. So any, any reduction of overflows can reduce nitrates. The other big uh, source of nitrates in the watershed is probably septic systems. So yeah. you know, there, was, there was a project that the Watershed Association um, and NRWI put together a few years ago to do a, a waste, what do they call it, the residential water audit in the silver mine basin. So, yeah. you know, looking at septic systems, potentially providing some um, incentives for people to do work improvements or pumping. So, you know, that's something we've been kicking around for a while. Um, it's not an easy thing to implement and find money for, but certainly would be helpful, I think, to get people to educated on how to maintain and the necess necessity to maintain their septic systems and the value. And so. Chris, that's something that a 319 might cover, something that's that sort of soft of talking, getting in people's yards. Yes. And, okay. I know we talked about that. It didn't, it didn't get funded that. the last time you applied, but um, it certainly, it, it could be a really good idea, I think. Especially okay. if it was done on a large scale, which would take staff and people. But, yeah. Okay. Gaff? Yeah, I'm again, sorry for talking so much. But Chris, in, in the water quality report, the, the, the indicators that they're talking about, uh, dissolved organic carbon, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, water clarity, seaweeds, and oxygen saturation. But there's no mention of bacteria. Now, now in, in the watershed, you know, work that we've we've done, and and uh, you know, the, the the bacteria, different types of it, have been the, the principal indicator or pollutant that we've been concerned with because of the effect on public health and also on the shellfish resources. So, is there a reason that the re this report does not talk about yeah. bacteria yeah. levels? Is it because that these pollutants that, that they're looking for now sources of money that that will that will address these particular pollutants? What, what, well, why haven't they mentioned bacteria and, and uh, as, as, as a pollutant of concern? Well, especially, EPA especially with and, the urban, uh, in, uh, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. EPA and the two states have done an intensive amount of work in the last few years on reducing the hypoxia levels in the bottom waters in the sound. And now we're moving up into the, into the abatement. So, Nitrogen is the primary pollutant that causes those oxygen deficiencies. They did a lot of talk about how we best monitor the trends and they decided nitrogen varies quite a bit from season to season. So that dissolved organic carbon was probably the best indicator that they could use for a report card and monitor over the years trends. So, but they're, they're mostly concerned with solving the hypoxia in the, in the abatements. That's, so they, they, they moved from a focus. Sure, we're still well, we're still concerned with, with, with uh, bacteria and pathogens, and, and there's a lot that aquaculture and the Department of Ag is doing with that too. But, but this particular initiative with EPA is with our inland water resource management, integrated water resource management, and also um, you know, the Long Island Sound study is all about taking care of the hypoxia to improve the biological productivity of the, of the sound and, and now the estuary. So that's that's okay. the focus. It doesn't take anything away from the bacteria issues. Uh, Chris, just a couple of, of points. We started studying, I started studying the river back in 1972. And when the water temperature gets above 70 degrees, we know it's going to become hypoxic. Now, you're not going to, I don't, I don't know what superior capabilities the EPA has, but changing the temperature of the water uh, is, is highly improbable. So that well, has, let me ask you how far, and especially, how far since, out is that? pardon? That the, how far out does that DO deficit extend? And I understand the inner harbor inside the bridges is, is doomed when you get that warm, but 
further out where the shellfish industry is and does that also get as quickly hypoxic it depends it doesn't get no. as quickly hypoxic does but it, not. it depends on the on the temperature it depends on the mm. amount of rainfall it depends on right. the storms that are available and it also depends on the fish population i mean we the the harbor this past year or in 2019, they rated a B, the, the outer harbor. And yet, mm -hmm. a lot of the people that are sitting here participating in the Zoom meeting were around when we had the fish kill in the harbor, and it was tons of dead menhaden that died because, first of all, there were too many menhaden for the harbor to support. The bluefish schools were at the mouth of the harbor, keeping them corralled. They sucked up, sucked up the oxygen. And these are natural events that are hard to shut down. And part of being a scientist is we have to take a look at what happens naturally and what happens that is man created. And going back to the to the nitrogen and Jeff's point with the, the bacteria, if we have high E. coli discharges from the pipes, and we've known about them since 1991, where we had two interns that hiked the harbor and collected samples from every pipe. If you're getting high E. coli coming from the pipes, there is organic waste coming out of those pipes. And when I ask, save the sound, how often and how frequently they tested nitrogen, they said they didn't, but they counted on other people to do it. And when I called the aquarium, they said they did it sporadically. When I called uh, Sarah Crosby, she said they did it off and on but did not do it specific to the discharge pipes. So they wanted to attribute and point the finger to a lot of people using fertilizer, but no one tested upstream from, I would say cross street north to find out if the nitro nitrogenous waste were coming downstream because you're not going to get much fertilizer discharge on the harbor. There are not a lot of lawns. So it, it's, we're getting mixed signals for those of us that know the harbor. Any well, comments? Yeah, I can answer Chris, not... a question about how far does epoxia go out? The I-95 bridge is about it. I've been studying this harbor for 30 years, doing oxygen studies just about every week during the summer. And the I-95 bridge yeah. is about as far at, out as hypoxia goes, period. You maybe you get a four once in a while south of that, but not very often. That's that's a good good signal. But uh, you know, I think I think to address the problem, you really have to look at it. Um, all over and, and, and understand that the nitrogen that's coming down from the upper watershed doesn't, doesn't get attenuated very much. So septic systems and fertilizers, absolutely right. resources. As is, the wastewater plants have all been tightened up on their discharges, but as you know, there are occasionally overflows at Norwalk. So um, in the, the ge geography of the basin, the way it's constricted is, is like you said, and the temperature is, is a deadly combination for the upper harbor, but yeah, and two, uh, two thirds. We're moving in the right direction, putting attention on it. It's unfortunate that it makes you guys look bad. Uh, and, and it was save the sounds report card, not deeps, but at the same time, you know, it's it's an idea of where we need to focus attention, and I think that'll help. Obviously, it hurts your publicity for your shellfish industry, or whatever, but. Uh, it, it certainly will help with getting attention for more potential fixes down the road. So, 
and two, Chris, two thirds of our harbor itself um, is so shallow that it becomes a heat sink during the summertime. Mm -hmm. And because of that, everything can warm up. And what, when I worked at the aquarium, we had the one monitor in place and we would get nighttime hypoxia uh, mm -hmm. frequently during the summer at the aquarium dock. So as far as Dick was concerned, that's a little bit south of, of the I-95 bridge, but we were seeing it and some nights it would actually go down to zero. When it went down to zero, it was usually associated with Menhaden being in the area and, and large schools of them. And as, as much as it would tank within one tidal cycle, it would go away, it would disappear. And you'd have back to oxygenated water. So it was a good thing. So it all depends on what's going on and when's the testing taking place. Any other, any other comments? Jeff? Uh, sorry, again, if you don't mind, it's a very good discussion. Um, in, in the, uh, the list of all the bays and, and, the, and the grades for, for, for the bays, it, there's a note that says that the data for each of those bays is provided courtesy of the organizations listed. And then for the Norwalk Inner and Middle Harbor, Harbor Watch is listed as the source of the data. So, so of course, we're not, we never suggested that, that, that the data should not be shared or, you know, because it's collected for the purpose of improving the management of the harbor. But I, I think I, that, that, that my suggestion is the Harbor Commission and the Shellfish Commission should talk with Harbor Watch about the money that, that those commissions provide each year to Harbor Watch and, and what, what's, what's provided, what, what data is collected for, you know, for, for those funds and then have an agreement that if, if, if the data is going to be used for, for purposes other than directly managing Norwalk Harbor, as a courtesy, we should be informed of what, what the data is to be used for. Not, not, not to limit it, of course, but just to understand what, what we're paying for. That, that's, that's my, that, that was my thought several years ago when the, when the, the C- minus report card came out. Um, but I, I think the Harbor Commission and the Shellfish Commission may may want to, should, should pursue that. Um, I think, the, the, Jeff, one more thing they, that should be in that agreement is also the fact that if there is data that re raises a red flag, we should be notified immediately. Yeah. Right. And, and, and every year we should get a report on, on, the, on the data that, on, on what, what's collected for the, for the money that the two commissions right. provide. Let's just uh, I'll finish with that. You could also just ask for a, a, like a schedule of sharing the data, maybe, you know, quarterly or monthly. And just I'm sure that they would just pass it to you. And, and then you can see any red flags yourself, ourselves. You know what I mean? Just to have a routine access. Part of this commission looks at the data through the year. We used to get the reports back in the day. Yeah, but it's usually after the year is done. Um, yeah, well, but it, it's at the tail end of the summer, or if there was any red flags, we were made aware of it. That's when well, Dick, Dick, that's Dick was when, notorious for making us aware of it. When Dick was doing it, that's what used yeah. to happen. It's not happening but, anymore. But Sarah is so great about sharing if you ever ask. You know, they, they have three people running that place. It's a lot. I, I think we would have to be a little proactive and seeking uh, some kind of system where we see it. It's and, having, and, and done what? Sampling, having done the sampling, it's not hard for somebody to pick up a phone and saying, this is what we're seeing on our dissolved oxygen test, or this is what we're seeing on a nitrogen test. It's an indicator of a serious problem. We need you to be aware of it. Right. And anybody doing the testing should be able to do that. But is the money going, and maybe Dick knows this or Tom, is it specifically to test water quality offshore of the beaches and, and that we're funding because the, to, to help the Department of Health do this? Or is it to 
to test the, the, the water that the in, interns collect? I, I'm not, I've lost, I think, we've lost I track, think, I think, I think of what... The what, way to do this is to talk to Sarah, because I no right. longer am the director up there, and I don't, I'm not in charge of those funds. I'm out, I monitor seven harbors, of which Norwalk is one. You guys got the report on it. If you want to report every week, I'll be glad to give it to you. Well, that's your that's your work, though, Dick, right? That's right. Yeah. But still monitoring the water quality in the harbor. Well, I'm just talking, right, and that's good work. I'm just talking about the, the work that's done with money that the Shellfish Commission and the Harbor Commission provide. That and and we'll, 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 we'll follow up on it. Okay. Well, what's the lowest extent of Sarah's monitoring, Harbor Watch is monitoring at this point? I was under the impression it was mostly Dick and Norm Bloom's outfit that was doing the harbor. And you're and under the right impression. Wall. That's exactly what wall. Wall. Sarah's working on that yeah. save, oh, sound wide program, and she makes a couple of trips a month, I think, out there. Okay. Well, but that, but then that gets back to the question: What, what, what is the money going for that, that, that the Harbor Commission and the Shellfish Commission are are providing? I um, have to ask her. Right, and that's what we'll do. And is any Dick? Is anybody testing up the river? They are. They, they not, Norwalk yeah. River gets monitored every summer. Okay, then that's what we need to get also, because that's how we know what's coming down river. They also put out a report on that. But am I correct that that doesn't tell us nitrogen? No. Right, the integrated right. report we need for that. They uh, just to tell you that that money goes towards the interns that do the river the testing on the rivers and stuff. That's what we can donate our money for. Two interns for the summer program. Yeah. Okay. That's where John, the money goes. John, you're muted. Who's muted? John Romano. Yeah, Tony Andrea used to give a monthly report back in the day when he was on the water quality uh, uh, committee. Yeah. And he he got input and information, and I, I thought it came from you, Dick. But he would give a detailed report, pass it out. It was handwritten, and, and we'd go over all the parameters of the report. Yeah, I think we did give it to him. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, the, uh, the Harbor Watch um, monitoring for Norwalk River does measure ammonia, NOx, total nitrogen, and total phosphorus okay. currently. So they do have nutrient data in the Norwalk River and the silver mine and Comstock. So well those all service. feed into us so we can get an idea of what's coming downstream. Mm-hmm. Jeff? Uh, two, two more things. Is that the rest of the agenda, Joe, is, is completed now? Or I have That's... Two, two, two other things. And Chris, you know, we're getting back to the topic that we discussed several years ago, how to resume the Norwalk River Watershed Initiative. And, you know, and the, and the pandemic, of course, has affected that. And uh, Alexis has now been um, promoted, or if that's the right word, or switched jobs to to another job. So we still have that <laughs> that task, if it was, which was a priority at the beginning of the year, is is to reestablish at least to have quarterly meetings. You know, where, where people can do. Do you maybe we could think about that between now and the next water quality meeting? How we could organize that, and who. Yeah. Who, if, if, if Alexis isn't going to be able to do it, if someone else can do it, just, just to put out well, an agenda every three months and, and, and uh, contact people. And, uh, it turns yeah, I get the impression that Alexis is doing two jobs now, not just what she's doing. But I think that there is some money to get uh, Chris Sullivan, Southwest Conservation District, involved with resurrecting the initiative. So it's a conversation that I can, I can try to pursue. As to how and we maybe get we, another meeting. All right, and, and maybe the Harbor Commission could take a more active role, at least in, in, in helping to to at least organize a meeting every every three months to talk about matters that, that are of concern throughout the watershed. Mm -hmm. So that that's my other 
And I have w one other comment, you know, for the members of the committee. Since, since the last water quality meeting, I think, you know, we lost one of the best friends Norwalk Harbor has ever had, and Tony Mobilia. Now, he, he was a member of the Harbor Commission beginning in 1987, and he was involved in every major piece of work that the, that the commission worked on, including, including the Norwalk River Watershed Initiative and, and, and the, the recent work on the Yankee Doodle Bridge, the dredging projects, the harbor management plan, the bridge projects. Uh, he, he was an example, I think, to everybody who would want to think that they could serve on a municipal commission and be a, a public, public servant. And, and he just re really will be missed. And it was, it was a shock to lose Tony. And I think we should all be appreciative of, of what, what Tony contributed to the city of Norwalk uh, as, as a volunteer. So th th thank you for letting me say that. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, is the Harbor Commission planning to have a special, um, not a plaque, but a naming of something for Tony? Um, yeah, yes. We're working on that. All right. Could you invite uh, members of the Water Quality Committee when that is uh, happening? Of course. Yeah. Sure. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any anything else? Okay. Um, we need to take a look at the minutes from the last meeting and get somebody to make a motion to approve them or make changes. I did send them to you. I make a motion to approve the minutes. Thank second. you. Your, do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Vote? Any opposed? Okay, the minutes pass. And we're getting near our pumpkin time. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? Steve? Make a motion. Okay. Peter, you, you'll second it. Second. And we'll see you next month. Or in 15 minutes. <laughs> yes. I have, to jump. I have to go up to Milford. So, uh, marketing people up there. Moderator, I will need Jeff Stedman added to the next meeting and video and audio, please. I added Jeff to the uh, request, Steve. He should be, he should have gotten the email. Okay. Thank you, Tom. You all have a good Thanksgiving and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Take okay. care, everyone. Thank you. Good night. 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 See you in 15 Bye,